Welcome back, Teenage Hylian, to another episode of Video Game World Tours, a series where I shine a spotlight on weird little spots you might have missed in games you love. Today, we return to the land of Ocarina of Time and explore its dark future. If you missed the first episode, check it out in the cards or description. Our tour begins with the Temple of Time. When you first enter as a child, it's very mysterious. The platform with the Triforce, an altar, and a large imposing door, the Door of Time. All you're told is a passageway to the sacred realm lies beyond it. There's such a strong aura around this place, it feels so important. Princess Zelda tells you the story of how the Temple of Time was built to protect the Triforce from no good evildoers. Coming in here, seeing the perfectly kept interior, it really drives home the importance of your journey to stop Ganondorf. Once you offer up the three elemental stones and the door of time opens, the Master Sword is revealed to you. What an iconic room. I talk a lot about empty space in this series, but that's only because it's such a powerful tool in the level designer's pocket. In here, it's used to perfectly frame the tiny sword in the stone at the center of the room. The Master Sword is the most important item in Ocarina of Time, and they wanted its reveal to have weight. I mean, look at this! So much space, all for a tiny sword. It almost feels like this is needed to contain the sword's spiritual power. And the fact that it was hidden behind the door of time for god knows how long, it's just weird. You are the first person to set foot in here for a good while, and you almost don't want to grab the sword. Should you be the one to awaken it from its lengthy slumber? Even ignoring all that nonsense, the Temple of Time is a cozy place. This is one of those areas I rarely explore outside of walking to and from the point of interest. Like, I don't think I ever walked back here. What a nice little space. With that, let's plunge ourselves into the future and become a teenager. I don't feel any different. <laughs> um, anyways, a lot has happened in the past seven years. Let's survey the land to see what everything's like. Heading back to Kokiri Forest is a real downer. Monsters have taken over the village, forcing the helpless Kokiri to hide in their homes. The once joyful tune is gone. And it's subtle, but the sky changed as well. It's a little bit darker than it was seven years ago. I could see this lighting being comforting in a different context, but here, with Deku Babas and scrubs everywhere, it's just sad. And what's more, the Kokiri don't even recognize you, which kind of makes sense considering Kokiri never age. Despite growing up in Kokiri Forest, Link is actually a Hylian, orphaned from a past war and entrusted to the Deku Tree. It doesn't even register in these people's minds that this teenager could be the same kid that left the village seven years ago. It's somber. You return home after being gone for so many years, but you don't have the emotional satisfaction from the people you grew up with recognizing that you returned. It's like there's an unrelieved tension. Beyond that, the environment feels awkward too. Everything is the same size as it was when you walked around as a kid. It reminds me of that feeling when you visit a school you used to go to, or a house you used to live in, and everything feels so small. That, combined with the copious amounts of enemies, really reinforces that things have changed. I mentioned in the first video that Kokiri Forest feels like it's this haven for kids that never grow up, and how it's unsullied by the problems of the outside world. But here you are, a teenager revealed to not even be one of them, walking around in an infested version of the town. It kind of sours that whimsical feeling I felt here as young Link. Not all hope is lost though. If we're to save the village, we must head to the Force Temple. In the first video, I didn't cover any of the game's dungeons. For whatever reason, I don't feel particularly strongly about the early ones. But the Forest Temple? I can't get enough of this place. I describe Gokiri Forest as a place that feels hidden away from the rest of the world, but this? This feels truly secluded. 
deep in the forest at the end of a long passageway is a room with a lot of space. It's very breathable compared to the narrow maze and corridors you went through to get here. What's of note with this room is the slight aesthetic shift. Notice that inhabitants of Gokiri Forest don't really build structures. The only buildings you see here are hollowed out trees. They didn't import a ton of building materials to construct a market or anything like that. It's a very naturalistic design language. But here, deep in the sacred forest meadow, it's a little bit different. You have this presumably ancient castle built long before your time, maybe even the Deku Tree's time. And when I say built, I mean built. Look at all these bricks. And these little details here, this was a place that was designed. Looking at it from the outside, you get a sense of importance from the building. It's elevated above you. At one point there were stairs, but they crumbled into nothingness. What I love about the Forest Temple is the marriage of the forest aesthetic with the abandoned castle aesthetic. Going through the threshold, you're presented with the true entrance to the temple. This is one of my favorite rooms in the game. Something about these indoor trees with this overhang and a crazy tall ceiling all comes together to be super memorable for me. Actually, there's a lot of memorable rooms in the Forest Temple. There's the Twisted Hallway. This kind of plays into the illusion sub-theming of the dungeon. You have the courtyards. These are great. It's not very often in the Zelda dungeon you get to look up and see the sky. In a way, it grounds it as a place in-world. It doesn't feel like some building completely sealed off from the outside. No, if you build a castle in a beautiful place like this, you'd want to get some of that fresh air. And this stairwell, I, I don't know why, but it's stuck with me. There's nothing particularly notable about it now that I'm trying to put it into words. I don't know, do you have any places like that in the game, or am I just crazy? Of course, you have the boss room. What a neat little place to be hidden away in your castle. I don't know if it's part of the temple's illusion that all these paintings are the same, or if whoever built this back in the day just really liked this one painting. Can't fault him for it, it's pretty nice. The next temple you visit is the Fire Temple. I don't have as much to say about this as I do the Forest Temple, but it's worth a brief visit. Before we even enter, I'd like to point out this little image at the end of this corridor designed to look like the inside of the Fire Temple. I love tricks like this. I noticed it's not quite accurate though. There's a totem thing blocking this door on the right that isn't there in the pre-rendered image of the entrance hall. I can hardly blame him for that though. It's such a small little detail, barely worth bringing up in a video like this. But I did anyway. Compared to the Force Temple, this actually feels like a temple. A real place of worship with these statues and ugh, the background music? The original version with the chanting and all sets the mood perfectly. As for a small little place, I always remember these rooms where the Gorons get locked up. There's something about these textures, they're just so rough. I guess it's supposed to be a plain old tunnel dug out from the rock? And these massive flames? These are way too big for just a simple light source. Either way, cozy room. The next dungeon is the Water Temple. And you know what? I don't think I've heard anyone talk about the Water Temple outside of its difficulty. Do your best to separate that side of the temple from the aesthetics here. Let's just appreciate the vibes. The first thing that stands out to me is the water reflecting onto all the nearby textures. It's a small detail that really adds a lot. Combined with the lighting, this feels like a mystic underwater cave. The textures and overall design are cool. Look at this little design on the doorframe or the design on the walls at the center of the room. How many unique patterns can you see on the centerpiece here? One, two, three, four, five, and six behind this hookshot panel. Something about games made back in the day, you had to be really considerate about what you included in the game. You couldn't just throw in as many textures and models as you wanted at as high as a resolution as you wanted. You had to be careful and conservative. Use what little storage space you have efficiently. 
In the budget for the textures, they had enough space to make this massive, intricate design. And once they did that, they reused it. Not necessarily the whole thing every time, just bits and pieces of it here and there. The whole game is filled with intricate textures, and thinking back to how I played in the day, I didn't notice any of that stuff. Here, more than most dungeons, I was focused on getting my bearings. But now, we get to appreciate them. A reoccurring element in the temple are these statues. Maybe it's a head raised up like this, or just a head by itself. There's enough of them to be more than just a one-off random decoration. What's the deal with these? What animal is this even supposed to be? A dog? A jackal? Maybe you have a better guess, I don't know. What do we have in the water temple in terms of memorable spots? You have this tiny little platform in a cave next to a waterfall? That's kind of cool. Um, the room leading to the boss is a little weird. It doesn't have stairs or anything, the ground just slopes up to it. Is that it? I can't really think of- oh, alright, I'll stop jerking you around. Of course I'm gonna talk about the Dark Link Arena. Walking through the door and seeing this is almost a shock. The game really throws you for a loop every now and then with the room's design. It's a scene out of a dream. As long as we're here, we might as well enjoy it. Let's look at every object in this room. You have the two doorways planted on little piles of sand. I love the trope of a mystical door not connected to an adjacent room. Hey, I've seen that texture before. There's this rock with a real gnarly texture. Oh yeah, now that is a texture. Over here is part of an archway. We actually saw one of these earlier. And to cap it all off, a tiny little island with a dead tree in the middle. I feel like I describe scenes as weird a lot, but they all pale in comparison to this. And there's something off about this room. Not necessarily the contents of the room, but the fact that it exists in the first place. This whole room being an illusion thing doesn't really fit in with the rest of the dungeon. To me, the water temple feels very mechanical. You're activating mechanisms that raise and lower the water, and you have these platforms on physical tracks. The magical illusion doesn't quite mesh with that technical vibe, you know what I mean? It seems like a better fit for the forest temple, considering that place's gimmick is trickery and illusions. You have the twisty hallway, the Poe sisters teleporting about, the room with the ceiling that falls down, and of course, Phantom Ganon going in and out of the paintings. Wait a minute, Phantom Ganon? The final fight of the temple is with a copy of Ganondorf? Was Dark Link originally supposed to be a mini-boss in the Forest Temple? That feels like too many connections to be a coincidence. Then again, you know how the human brain can be. Let me know what you think about that theory in the comments. Before we go, fun fact. Once you walk across the room and Dark Link spawns, Link's reflection in the water disappears. Second fun fact. If you take the camera beneath the floor, you can see that the reflections are just the objects above the water rendered below. Third fun fact- oh, that's, that's it, sorry. We're just gonna skip past the boring old Shadow and Spirit Temple and head right to Ganon's castle. I know this whole future is supposed to be dark and all, but stepping back and thinking about this for a second, I never really realized just how doom and gloom this all is. Remember the beautiful Hyrule Castle Yard from the first video, where we stopped to appreciate some flowers? This is where they should be. Now there's just a castle floating above a pit of lava? Is that what this is? It's just so depressing. Ganondorf is responsible for all this death and destruction, but I have to say, he has a pretty good sense for interior design. This purple carpet is pimpin'. The castle even has little themed sections after the major temples in the game. How cute. Once you start to ascend his tower, the tension really builds up. There's these long paths leading you upwards. The carpet, the design on the walls, it's so regal. At the top of it all is Ganondorf's throne room. Well, I say throne room, all he has is an organ. And he doesn't even have a bench to sit at while he plays. I love that this is the room at the very top of his tower, just a place to jam out. Let's take some short little stops on our way to the final spot on our trip. 
Dompei's Grave is where you race him through a maze to reach your prize at the end. If you fall behind, it's pretty easy to lose track of him, and after a short time, be placed back at the beginning. I wish there was a way to explore the maze without the time limit of the race. Granny's Potion Shop There is a lot to unpack here. She has these pots releasing fumes into her tiny shop. Hey, I recognize that liquid texture. This wall texture, this looks like something a grandma would put up. And she even has a well-behaved little kitty. She digs her comically pointed fingers into the poor fella, but they don't seem to mind. The last stop, coincidentally also in Kakariko, didn't plan that out, is the House of Skultilla. It's a nice, quiet place, aside from the John Carpenter-esque Skultilla people. Our journey through Ocarina of Time comes to an end as we approach our final destination. It may or may not be one you remember, but it's one that left an impression on me as a kid. At the far end of the Ice Cavern, a mini-dungeon you take on before the Water Temple, is this beautiful room. It's another one of those instances where the game catches you off guard with a crazy room. The ice throughout the cavern looked pretty dull, and the door leading into the room is pretty reserved. A lovely secret hidden at the end of an unassuming dungeon. This pattern on the wall is what sells it. Rather, the layering of the pattern. You can see that there's three layers, and they're vertically offset from each other a bit. And as you go further from the center of the wall, they become more horizontally offset as well. It's a simple enough trick that creates a beautiful result. A crystalline wall resembling the night sky. This is Ocarina of Time's quintessential weird little spot. If you're in the mood for another tour, check out my video on Super Mario 64. It's a different type of game than Ocarina of Time, but it has its fair share of interesting locales. Subscribe, check out my Patreon, join the Discord, you know how to support me. But only do it if you really want to. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next Video Game World Tours.